Ladies and gentlemen, today we will finally, after weeks and weeks of using it, Apple things happening and delaying this review, I will be reviewing the Galaxy S10 Plus. From the Apple Sheep perspective, a guy who loves iOS, a guy who loves using his Apple Watch, his AirPods, his iPad Pro, his MacBook Pro, his iMac Pro, he loves the ecosystem, he loves referring to himself in the third person. This man that literally shows up when you Google Apple Sheep is here to tell you today that the Galaxy S10 Plus is here to tell you today that the Galaxy S10 Plus is one of the best smartphones and one of the best smartphone experiences I've ever had in my life. Without further ado, let's begin. Yeah, this may shock you a little bit, and before we even get into the details of the phone, I want to address a lot of comments that I was getting when I did my video on features the S10 has that makes me jealous as an Apple user. A lot of people took that as Drew being honest, or being more fair, or being more open-minded, when I want to remind you guys that my one goal, and the one thing that stays true no matter what phone I'm reviewing, is that I am being brutally honest to all of you. I am saying exactly what I'm thinking, and the whole reason and I'm known as being kind of a controversial YouTuber and one who's known for getting lots of dislikes is because I'm not afraid to tell you what I'm thinking. So when I start telling you great things about the S10, that's not me suddenly dropping who I am. That's not me suddenly being fair or not being biased because while my bias still definitely falls towards Apple and I prefer Apple products, if I bash a product in the past, I try to back it up with my user experience and with factual evidence to suggest why I think Apple does it better, not just it has an Apple logo on it so it's better. Meaning my experience with the Galaxy Note 9 or the S9 in those videos, I tried to be as honest with you about what happened as I possibly can. And with the Pixel 3, I rant on that a lot because I had a bad experience with it. And now today, reviewing the Galaxy S10, I'm going to give you my honest feedback in my experience of this product because it has been very, very good. It's been very, very pleasant and enjoyable. And I can easily say the Galaxy S10 Plus has been the best Android experience I've ever had, while still mentioning that I ultimately think iOS is better than Android, not in customization, of course, but in optimization for both hardware, software, meshing, as well as having a more rich and diverse app store with more quality apps, and of course, ecosystem support. All that's still there, but regardless, without question, this has been the best experience I've ever had with an Android device. So let's start with something that I usually ignore in my reviews, that's battery life. If you follow my Twitter, you saw me do some battery life tests with the Galaxy S10+. Plus. This thing is an absolute beast in tank when it comes to letting your battery last all day. So in my line of work, I have a lot of Qi chargers, both at my desk so that when I'm working on videos, I can charge my phone. So I felt like in the past, I've always kind of had a not so accurate representation of what a lot of viewers out there may experience with their battery life. So I decided since the battery life on the S10 Plus was running so totally fine and it would sit on my Qi charger all day. And by the end of the day, I realized, hey, I haven't even hit 90% yet. I need to figure out what type of day-to-day -day use I can hammer on this thing and notice any type of battery loss. So I did an entire day where I did not put the S10 Plus on any Qi charger at my office or at home. That means that I started my day at around 4 a.m. taking it off the Qi charger and then used it throughout the day for vlogging over on Talos of Talks. I used this as my main camera to record my vlogs, to document my work. You're welcome to check out the video performance of the S10 Plus over there. And might I add the microphones on the Galaxy S10 Plus. Specifically when you're holding it this way and speaking as you're recording something else, the microphones sound insanely good. Happy to see that we've been recording this video for over seven minutes now. That's before the editing takes place. And the quality of it looks good. And the Snapdragon 855 is capable of recording this video for that long. Drastically improved from last year's generation and drastically improved from other Androids in the same department, which usually don't care that much about video. Samsung does because they allow you to record 4K at 60 for as long as you want to, as long as you record using the main lens. But yeah, I used it for vlogging. I listen to music off this thing. And I do a lot of live streamings over on Talos of Gaming as well. And when I do that, I read the chat on my phone. Using LTE, I watched the stream on Twitch so that I could read the chat, have the live stream playing so I know what my live stream looks like for all my viewers. And again, I streamed for a good solid maybe two hours almost with this thing not plugged into a charger at all. And of course, managing all my different social media on this thing as well. I'm in Discord a lot. I'm in there browsing 
browsing Twitter, I'm in there reading the news. Basically what I'm trying to say is without placing this thing on a Qi charger throughout the entire day, it lasted really, really well. And when I got home at the end of the day, my battery was still around 30% when I was ready to go to bed. So to continue this challenge and keep it going, I decided even when I go to sleep after using this phone extensively as much as I could and for as long as I could, I'm not going to place it on a Qi charger. I'm not gonna let it charge overnight. I wanna know what the standby time is for this device because Androids usually have a little bit worse standby time than iPhones. So I just turned the screen off, left it on a table and went to bed. I got a full night's rest, full seven, eight-ish hours. And when I woke up, picked it up and it was around like 27% battery. So the standby time with the Snapdragon 855 is much better than previous generations, which also meant that, yeah, I continue to use my phone throughout that morning and throughout that day, even though I hadn't charged it the night before or at all the previous day. Eventually, yes, the battery did get around to 1%, but it was not until around 11 a.m. of that following day, which meant that in its entirety, I basically got like 30 hours of battery life out of this thing, which in my experience is insane. I've done similar tests with my iPhones since doing that test, and I can confidently say the Galaxy S10 wins. Mind you, I also turned the display resolution on the Galaxy S10 up to Quad HD. So this was not the default Full HD out of the box, which means that if you were to use this with the default setting running at Full HD, you could potentially get even longer battery life than I got. I also didn't use any power saving techniques. Once I dropped below 20%, One UI was constantly asking me, turn on power saver mode, you know, activate some power saver settings. I ignored all of them. I wanted to keep using the phone at its full possible potential. And still I was able to last as long as I did, which was insane given this is not a bulky phone. This is very comfortable to hold. It's very thin. It's quite light. Definitely has a little bit more of a camera bump than the previous generations, but regardless, it's a very light and thin phone that has an insanely good battery that luckily doesn't explode, which is always something you should be grateful for. Now in referring to One UI, I do have to say, I think Samsung's skin over Android with their new user interface is far better than any other Samsung skin I've used in the past. This is coming from a guy who tested the Note 9, the S9, the S8, the Note 7. I've used lots of Samsung phones in the past and usually Samsung's skin is a little bit clunky and it always feels like it's fighting with Android at the same time. But with this, it felt incredibly seamless. It felt incredibly optimized, a lot of things feeling like iOS features that were pulled over, but I'm totally fine with it because I like iOS and I think that's the best operating system. So the fact that they made One UI a lot more like iOS is good in my mind. I don't care if you can copy another company and make your product better, then go for it. I won't criticize you for that. I actually, the day I bought this thing, activated gesture control because I'm so used to that on both my iPhone XR and before that the iPhone 10. So going back to swiping up now to go to my home screen, but Samsung gestures are a little weird. They're a little bit different. You swipe up on the right to go back and you swipe up on the left to activate multitasking. It's a little weird, but I got used to it pretty quickly. I definitely don't think gestures on the S10 are better than they are on iOS. iOS just feels more intuitive and the motion tracking with the apps and swiping them to go home, activating multitasking just feels more fluid, but I definitely can say that Samsung's UI is far more intuitive and far more easy to use than the weird new Android 9 gestures that I used on the Pixel 3. Those just felt clunky. They didn't feel thought through. There were still buttons being used and gestures simultaneously, and it just didn't feel like an ironed out experience at all. And with all my testing of the Galaxy S10 Plus, I never had apps crash. Everything felt very smooth. I never got the phone to lag that much, which I can't say the same about previous generation Samsung phones. Back with the Galaxy Note 9, even though it was a $1,000 phone, I still had some performance issues with it. I still had apps crash legit the first day I unboxed the phone. And I thought that was ridiculous given this was a $1,000 Samsung device that hardware wise was very premium. But then switching to this, everything was snappy. There was no apps crashing whatsoever. And I'm very happy to say that because in the past I did test out the Pixel 3, which crashed constantly for doing very basic things. So given the Pixel 3 was my last Android phone, this felt like quite an improvement. The design overall for the phone is pretty good. I think it's very futuristic and it does look very beautiful. And it's funny to me that in this situation, I think Samsung gets the prize for taking aesthetics to the absolute maximum. And I think actually Apple gets the number one place for me for being a design that's a tad more functional. So let me be more clear to what I'm referring to. Design things I like about the phone. The display is gorgeous. Of course, the colors pop, the brightness is excellent. The camera hole, which there's been a lots of debating about, in my opinion is no different from a notch. It's there, you notice it, you get used to it. And in my opinion, I don't really like using wallpapers that hide the notch like John Morrison did in his videos. 
Not that he's a bad photographer or anything. He takes really, really good pictures. But in my opinion, you don't really just sit and look at your home screen a lot. So when people use wallpapers that try to hide the camera hole, to me, that just makes the camera hole more distracting as soon as you launch an app. The home screen on your phone is really just showing you what do you need quick access to? What do you want to launch into really quickly? So I don't really use the S10 on the home screen all the time. I look at the home screen and then I go to the app I need to use. And once you open that app, then the camera hole becomes visible. So that's why with my wallpapers, I embrace the camera hole. I don't try to hide it. I like that it's there and I don't want it to be invisible on the home screen because then it just sticks out more when you open an app and then it comes back. I'm not saying the camera hole is worse than a notch in any way. It's just personally, I think it's a little asymmetrical and a little bit wonky to have it off to the right corner of the phone. It makes some apps look a little different and it makes screenshots look a little bit bizarre when all of your widgets at the top are moved over. I kind of prefer things being centered and I like that on the iPhone, the notch is, you know, visible, but at least it's in the middle. So you can have your icon widgets on one side and a little bit more on the opposite side. I think it just looks better. That's of course just a personal preference thing. There's no logical reason as to why the Galaxy S10 camera hole is worse, except for one thing I could bring up. If there was one logical argument I could use against the camera hole, it would be that in order to get the camera hole, which some call a floating notch, in order to look like it's taking up less space on the device, they have to move it away from the corner of the phone and closer to the viewing area, which is the center, this main area of the phone. When that camera hole has to be moved down a little bit more, you'll notice that if you use an app in landscape mode and they black out the camera hole, you notice that that blacked out space is actually thicker than previous generation foreheads that Samsung has had. Compared to the Note 9 and the S9, the forehead is visible at the top, but it's not very thick. With this, once they black out the camera hole, the forehead suddenly becomes quite large. And I think that forehead could have been a lot smaller and the camera could have been placed a lot less closer to the center of the screen and resulted in a more immersive experience where the camera is not intruding on the content and it's more out of the way. If you use a notch, you can get that camera closer to the bumper. If you do a camera hole, you kind of have to move it away from the bumper so that you can cram more pixels behind the camera, which do those extra pixels really make the experience more immersive? In my opinion, no, it's still an irregularity. It's still a camera cut out regardless if it's a notch or a hole. So either way, it's just fine. I just would rather have it placed in the middle, but again, personal preference thing. Some people might like it in the top right corner and that's good for you. I also don't like the placement of the buttons. I've seen lots of other YouTubers bring this up and I can agree with them. Ironically, the most ergonomically placed button on the whole device is the Bixby button, which I don't think should exist. And no, I don't care that you can remap it to something else because in my opinion, you don't need a fourth button on a phone, particularly if you're going to put it directly below the volume rocker because now if you're reaching for your phone and you want to turn down the volume, you're more prone to accidentally pressing Bixby instead of the down volume key. And especially given this is a much larger phone, it would make much more sense to me that if you have to have a digital assistant button of some kind that you would put it more up and out of the way and you could make the power button a bit more ergonomically easy to reach because this is a large display on a phone and that power button is pretty high up there and can be quite difficult to reach sometimes as is the volume rocker. I think it's pretty high up on the phone that you have to kind of readjust the way you're holding it just to be able to change the volume. I would have liked if the buttons could have been lowered a little bit more and I would personally still remove the Bixby button. Doesn't matter to me that it's remappable. It just doesn't need to be there. The edge display on Samsung phones always looks really, really cool. It's really, really neat to see that display kind of melting over the sides of the device. But in my opinion, it's all aesthetic and not very function because I always and am constantly setting off the screen on accident because of this edge display. I wish that over the years they could get a little bit better at detecting that, oh, someone's just picking up the phone. They're not trying to tap something on the screen or someone's trying to reach across the device. They don't mean to tap something with the palm of their hand. But because the display has those curves and it spills over the sides of the phone, I still find myself doing that. And it's been a common issue I've had in previous generation Samsung phones too. The point that I wish I could get the S10e non-curved display with the flat edges all the way around, except on this size of a device. The Galaxy S10e looked really compelling to me. It's just, I don't like smaller phones. I like having the biggest battery possible and I didn't want to make any compromises on the camera, which is ultimately why I went with this device to review. But still, I think there's a lot of people out there that would rather have the flat display all the way around. I don't care if the bezels are a little bit thicker. It looks more uniform on the S10e. And as I've mentioned in the past, it's not necessarily about having the highest screen to body ratio. It's just about having the most clean, uniform design. And that's why I like the look of iPhones so much is because they're the only ones who seem to get the idea of one size 
size bezel all the way around. Whereas this, you have a chin a certain size, you have a forehead a certain size, you have the side bezels a different size. Everything's kind of asymmetrical to a certain extent. But once again, personal preference. You may love the design and I can't really argue with you on that because it is still a very, very good looking phone. I love the chrome finish of the edges. I love the color changing of the white glass on the back. I think that looks really nice. Overall, a very great looking phone. I just think a tad less functional than an iPhone because those little bit of bezels the iPhones have on their edges make it easier to not set off the display when you don't mean to. In regards to the triple camera on the back, I think they are excellent. In the past, I wasn't really a big fan of ultra wide lenses, but this is the first phone I've ever tested that has one. And I actually really, really like it. And as I talked about in my S10 Jealousy video, I really want an ultra wide lens on my iPhone now because showing that off when you're showing this phone to someone else and being like, look how much stuff you can fit in one angle. It's really, really neat. It's just, there's bizarre video limitations that I don't really understand. So with the ultra wide lens, you can record video with it at 4K, 1080p and 720, but it absolutely has to be 30 frames a second. If you want to shoot with the ultra wide lens, you cannot record at 60. At 1080p, at 4K, I don't know why. Why is that limitation there? I have no idea. Megapixel wise, I believe is very close or the same to the main lens. That allows you to record 60 FPS or 4K at 60 as long as you want to. And the telephoto lens also has this limitation as well, which just confused me a little bit. But still, really good at taking pictures, as many YouTubers have brought up. Samsung tends to overexpose with the lighting a little bit, but regardless, as I've mentioned in the past, photo taking of all modern smartphones is very good and should not be the deciding factor on whether or not you upgrade to a phone. One of them gets lighting or colors slightly differently. All premium smartphones these days take really good pictures. So don't let that be a deciding factor for you here. Is it the best at taking pictures? Probably not. Is it good enough for day-to-day -day use? Absolutely. For someone who's taking pictures on their smartphone, it will be fine. I really love the tiny features that Samsung packs in these things as well. I think my favorite bonus add-on with the Galaxy S10 has to be the reverse wireless charging. The idea that you can charge your Galaxy Buds with your smartphone battery because the battery on this phone is so good is really, really smart, and I'd love to see that on the next iPhone. It doesn't really make sense to do with other phones because the wireless charging is so slow, 4.5 watts, even slower than that tiny charge brick iPhones ship with. So yeah, don't do that with another smartphone, especially big smartphones, because it would just charge so slowly. It's not really worth it. But for smaller things like Galaxy Buds or the Galaxy Watch, totally practical and makes a ton of sense. Stereo speakers get really, really loud on the Galaxy S10. I've listened to music with this and they are quite impressive. Samsung didn't disappoint and I think they're certainly louder than the last generation. And I think comparing them to my iPhone, they get a little bit louder and they sound a bit clearer. So better than my iPhone XR in that regard. And I hate to even bring this up, but I noticed when I swapped my SIM over to this phone, LTE seemed to be a lot faster. It makes me wonder if something's up with iPhone's modems or something's up with my particular XR where LTE is a lot slower. But when I switched over to the S10, I got better speeds on my cellular connectivity, which I'm sure a ton of you probably know more about that than I do. But regardless, internet speeds are great. Camera is excellent. Battery is excellent. Speakers are great. Design is pretty good. Very aesthetic based and not as much function based in my opinion. Front facing camera is just as good as other smartphones of this same price as well. So now comes the end of the review question. Well, Drew, it seems you like a lot of things about this phone. Why don't you switch to it? Does this make you want to ditch your iPhone? Did using this phone make you not like your 10R anymore? Well, <sighs> this comes the end of the review that everyone starts hating me for. This is a great phone and this has easily been one of the best experiences I've ever had with a smartphone. However, while using it, while using One UI, while using this premium hardware and the very optimized software, I still run into the hurdles that I honestly don't even think are Samsung's fault. It more comes down to Android and more of its clunky app market alongside trying to fight Samsung over the UI and my overall wanting to be back within my Apple ecosystem is what made me not really want to keep using this. Even while I was using it and I was impressed with everything and I could do everything I needed to do, record 4K at 60, do my vlogging, manage my social media. This allowed me to do everything I normally need a phone to do, but it's just not doing it to the same extent or to the same continuity that I'm used to with my iPhone. And we're comparing this to my iPhone 10R, by the way, a much worse phone on paper in basically every way. Bigger notch, only one camera on the back, lower pixels per inch, smaller screen, bigger bezels, aluminum matte finish build, some would say a more cheap look overall, probably slower charging, no headphone jack. Funny how a lot of YouTubers aren't even bringing up the headphone jack in their review anymore. It's like, oh yeah, that's there. But I still found myself wanting to switch back to iOS 4. You guessed it, all of those same ecosystem experiences that I can't necessarily get with 
the Samsung because Samsung only controls so much of what their phone can do and switching out of the Apple ecosystem entirely, you can't really compare to what Apple offers between your MacBook Pro, your Apple Watch, your iMac Pro, your iPad Pro, AirDrop, continuity, iMessage, all of those benefits that are still present over on Apple's side, I can't get them here. And I'm sure lots of you guys guessed this, but I would rather have Face ID, a good biometric, than two biometrics, which are okay. A lot of you were probably wondering why I haven't brought it up yet, but the face unlock on the Galaxy S10 is incredibly insecure. It can be fooled with a picture, and I understand that. However, it does work from many different angles, which I liked. I can unlock my S10 in landscape mode, even upside down with the face unlock because it's just looking at my face. The fingerprint reader for me worked somewhat, but I do have psoriasis, which can interfere with a lot of fingerprint readers' reliability. It worked on occasion, but I definitely could not get it to work as fast as other YouTubers were getting it to work, where they're able to just barely rest their finger there and it unlocks. I had to hold mine down quite a bit, and when the screen was off, trying to find that exact place to place my fingerprint every single time was a little bit more difficult. You know, with iPhones in the past, you know to place your finger on the home button. Now that there's no home button here and the screen's off and I place my finger down, it oftentimes has no match and I have to keep pressing it over and over again. Same fingerprint reader issue of my hands being wet if I just get out of the shower or I just wash my hands after doing the dishes. Fingerprint reader won't work then. So I'd rather have one really good biometric than two okay. And unlocking your phone is something a lot of people do. So I was missing my iPhone for that part of this experience. So I did like that how with one UI, why Samsung now, when you turn off the phone, makes the screen go all the way off. It doesn't default to an always on display. I appreciate that. And I also really, really love on iPhones that they brought over to Samsung the lift awake where you can just lift the phone up and the screen turns on. Love that about iPhones and I haven't had it on Samsung in the past. So now that it's there, that's really awesome. But ultimately this is a great phone and anyone who chooses to go with this phone, I won't blame you. You're making an excellent choice and I think you're gonna have a lot of pro features. However, if you do care about how smartphones interact with other devices, whether it be watches, headphones, other computers and tablets, I still think the iPhone comes out on top for ecosystem support. And the ultimate reason that you can make an amazing piece of hardware like this and still have someone like me miss my iPhone is because when we're reviewing these pocket computers that we take everywhere we go, all of them generally do kind of the same stuff. And everything that the S10 has over the iPhone XR is going to be incredibly incremental. At the end of the day, what do I need my phone to do? I want to record high resolution high frame rate videos. I want to listen to music. I want to browse social media. My iPhone does that. The Galaxy S10 does that. They just have slightly different methods of doing so. And at the end of the day, my iPhone is going to work with a lot more professional apps on the iOS app store, like LumaFusion and Over. I can find a few pro apps on the Android Play Store, but it's really just not the same. The optimization is not as good between app market and hardware. As great as the hardware is on here, it doesn't have that support system, which ultimately I use a lot more and I appreciate a lot more because I can just open my MacBook and it unlocks because I have an Apple Watch. I can open my AirPods and pair them directly to my iPhone in like a single tap compared to Galaxy Buds which have attempted to do a similar thing with the Samsung but regardless it's still like you open the lid you hit connect and then you have to hit allow like seven times and then it has to open a second app the Galaxy wearables app and then you have to hit that button allow allow allow. There's also no pairing button on the Galaxy Buds Buds compared to AirPods, which means switching from Galaxy Buds to a different device is way more complicated. And as someone who uses my iPad a lot and uses my MacBook a lot, uses my phone a lot, having AirPods and letting me switch between devices so seamlessly is way more convenient than the Galaxy Buds, which I made a whole video on and they're a great pair of earbuds. They sound excellent. They're packed full of features, but in regards to intuitiveness, they're just a little bit more behind. To unpair them from the S10, you have to go into Bluetooth settings and make the Galaxy S10 forget it. And then you just have to make sure the lid is open and then it goes into Bluetooth pairing mode so you can pair it with a different device opposed to AirPods which just have a pair button on the back. You just hold down the button, boom, they're ready to pair. So much easier than having to go into settings and forget your old device. AirPods pause when you take them out of your ear. There's a mode that lets you do that on the Galaxy Buds but it's definitely not by default and it also depends which one you take out. So if you take out the left one, they won't pause. Oftentimes they'll connect to the S10 when I just open the case and I'm listening to music or a video on here and they'll just start playing just because the case is open and I'm like I haven't put the headphones in yet you know just wait until they're in my ears and then transfer the audio over that's how airpods work but still they are more affordable I'm not docking the galaxy buds I'm just saying when I first reviewed them I had a lot of nice things to say about them having used them more extensively now I can definitely say they're worse than airpods now that there's the new generation 
collection as well. And price wise, I think they're pretty close anyway. So really good, but not as great as AirPods. And also switching between devices within the Apple ecosystem and using AirPods is so much easier. Just being able to go to AirPlay settings and just toggle between headphones. Of course, iMessage is really hard to beat when you switch to an Android. A ton of people that automatically get switched to green text bubbles. FaceTime is more complicated. Logging into my social medias that require two-factor authentication is much easier if you have iOS in your ecosystem because you'll get that code texted to you and it will automatically fill in on your Mac. So I use that legit like four to five times a day and suddenly when I switch to an Android and that feature is gone, it's very noticeable. So basically what I'm saying is all smartphones, premium or not, basically do the same stuff for us, but the advantage to the iPhone is the way it interacts with all those other devices. And that's really, and I mean this in the best possible way in regards to Samsung Galaxy, that's really the biggest thing and the only thing the iPhone XR has over the Galaxy S10. In regards to hardware, display, speaker quality, lens options, headphone jack options, reverse wireless charging, like features overall, yeah, if you're just comparing the iPhone XR to the Galaxy S10, this wins in most departments. But in my opinion, the iPhone wins in the one or two departments where it really makes a difference to the point that, yeah, the Apple Sheep, he's not switching to the Galaxy S10 permanently. I enjoyed using it though. I think it's an amazing phone. If I had to give it a letter grade, I'd give it an A+. They knocked it out of the park with everything, but ultimately the Apple Sheep is staying within that walled garden because as cool as this little oasis out in that desert is, it's not enough to get me to think I can get a better experience with my technology by swapping my SIM over. I'm sure that upset a ton of you out there, so I apologize, but once again, I don't blame you if you go with the Galaxy S10. I am super ingrained into Apple's ecosystem, but you may not be. If you don't have much loyalty there and you don't have much attachment there, absolutely give the Galaxy S10 a try. I think you would really enjoy it because as one of Apple's biggest fans and one of Apple's biggest defense lawyers, there's not much bad I can say about the Galaxy S10. This was by no means a rant video. If anything, this is a recommendation. So anyway, thank you guys for watching so very much for sticking around for this long video. And if you end up trying out the Galaxy S10, I really genuinely do hope you enjoy it. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you in the next one.